So um, hi everyone, uh, and welcome to the talk number six of the Land Africa talk series. So today, as speaker, we have uh, Miss Cynthia Kinoa, um, who is a final year master student at the University of Nairobi. She is uh, passionate about impactful marketing research and is currently a performance manager lead for East Africa um, DHS supply chain. And she shared like some very interesting detail with her. So in her free time, she likes to write. She writes a lot of media articles and she plays badminton, hike and cycle as well. And yeah, so um, Cynthia, thank you. And I guess now the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I will take you through my talk. And uh, I hope that it benefits as many people as possible. So today's talk is delivering success in natural language processing projects. And uh, it's delivered by myself at Lan Africa Talks. Okay. So this is just a simple bio about me and uh, Dosu has explained it very well about my background and I'm actually gearing up to graduate this Friday. So my time as a student will be coming to an end. And this is just the simplified agenda of what we will be discussing in this uh, talk. So the first thing is, what is my inspiration for this talk? So this all started with a series of Medium articles. And um, these Medium articles are, were written over time. And the current and final part is a draft. So I'm hoping to share my the progress that I've made so far. And based on that, you should be able to see part five coming out soon. So the first thing we need to know is that the big picture matters, okay? So what do we mean about the big picture mattering? We start with a few definitions about what AI, machine learning, and NLP is. But to summarize all that you see there, it's very simple. AI is the broadest area, and then machine learning is a subset of AI, and then natural language processing, or NLP for short, is an even smaller area within AI, okay? But when we look at the real world, it's a bit more something like this, where we have um, both another application of machine learning, computer vision, and NLP working side by side behind the scenes, with a team of annotators, a team of, um, you know, data science professionals, data analysts, data engineers, software developers to build the app that brings it to life, and actual users of the machine learning model who can be able to advise accordingly. Yeah. So it's, that's why we can see that, one, it's very hard separating applications of machine learning. Two, machine learning is a team effort. And three, you need to always think about the end user when you're building any machine learning solution so that you can take the good work that is being done in the academic spaces and translate it into the industry spaces. So this brings us to now that there's this wide view of machine learning in the real world, it means that we need to start using learning aids to understand machine learning. And that's why there's this technique that is used called scaffolding, um, where basically according to the person who created this learning theory in education, a learner uses structured support, which is typically offered by a more experienced uh, student or a teacher, then that support is used to learn a challenging concept that is just out of the reach of that student. 
And then once they have mastered that concept, the teacher or the more advanced student can fade away and the scaffolding is taken off, just as you can see in this building. So in my case, when I was thinking about natural language processing projects, because of their complexity, there was a need for me to be that advanced student. So that is why I created my own scaffolding so that I can identify critical areas in NLP and facilitate end-to-end -end delivery of these kinds of projects. So that scaffolding is what we'll be discussing today, and it's called the NLP toolbox, um, which is described in the medium series that. I wrote that I had written earlier and I talked about earlier. So what is the NLP toolbox? Simply put, it is a collection of concepts, tools, and ideas available for building applications that can handle real world challenges around understanding content from all over the world. At the end of the day, real world NLP projects are meant to help connect us, are meant to help content that is produced globally be better understood. Yeah? So if I am to summarize my problem statement, very simply, it is this. Currently, uh, where NLP and machine learning in general is that this, there's this team of these highly specialized um, researchers, academicians, uh, machine learning engineers, and they have the box that which represents the machine learning solution. But when we use something, but there's a need for that box to be unopened so that everyone can be able to reap the benefits of machine learning and so that everybody can be able to understand um, even how their data is used, even if not to a deep technical level, and can hold um, people who create these models accountable. And that's why my proposition is this question mark right here, it is being answered by the NLP toolbox. So it brings us to the big question, what is actually inside the NLP toolbox? It is these things. So they look a bit random. So I will just quickly walk you through, but as we continue in this talk, they will start to make a lot of sense. So you have a bag of beach balls, you have a lip, you have a gear, and you have a model. Now this model would be the NLP representation of um, machine learning in the wild, right? So let's start with the beach balls, what are they? So these are simply put the problem beach balls. So, Anytime you are thinking about how to frame a problem, it's very important that we look at the real world as well as the technical aspects of the problem. And real world is basically who would benefit or which institution would benefit from the solution that we are creating. And the technical uh, aspect would be how does the work build on existing um, body of research in natural language processing. So we, consider, we ask a round of quest, two rounds of questions around these five areas. So this pain, what pain are you facing? What actually interests you within natural language processing? What is the location and population where the data is going to come from? What is the accessibility and the specificity, okay? And um, once you have that sorted, you now have all your beach balls in the bag and it ends up creating an abstract that is reflecting both real world and technical aspects of the project so that it's very balanced, yeah? The next part of the NLP toolbox is the exploration leap. So leap is an acronym for language, ideas, and personas. So you'll find that, again, we ask ourselves another round of questions addressing each part of the leap. So it can, be, it can get uh, very complex looking at uh, ways of representing text, ways of representing audio, but when we actually simplify and say, okay, what are we actually interested in? 
what languages are in this data set? Who are the personas of interest? What are the key ideas? Those are things that will generate insights even for the non-technical people in your team. So there are different ways of representing data. So for audio, it is typically represented in the form of a spectrogram. So I will just play for you a bit of it and you should be able um, to see some interesting connections, okay? So now let me try and play it and it should work this time around. Is it working? Yes. Welcome to Modeling the Relationship between GDP per capita and the informal sector in Kenya, a multiple causes and multiple indicators approach. This is a research report in mathematics 2021 written by me, Cynthia Thinwa, and submitted to the School of Mathematics in partial fulfillment for a degree in Master of Science in Social Statistics. This was published by the University of Nairobi on November 22nd, 2021. Join me on this journey to explore and understand the informal sector in Kenya over the past 40 plus years. Welcome. So do you Abstract. see that? Do you see that pose? So you'll find that that's, a spectrogram is a great way to represent sound because you'll find that this is stereo sound, it was an MP3. So it's mixed down into two channels. That's why there's the left and right and they look identical to each other. And then that pause that was at the end, you'll find that it, it is that pause between the end of the, the, the music and the introduction and then abstract. Right, so that is just one way of representing audio data, okay? So another way of representing um, text data, it's pretty simple. You'll find that this, you don't need to read this text. The point is that it's text, but when you look at the visualization on the left, this is a word cloud, and it really helps illustrate the weight of um, the word frequency within um, the text that you are looking at, okay? And it's also good to note that audio can also be transcribed and become text on its own that can be analyzed. So it's important to have different ways of visualizing both text and audio. So when we finish the leap, we enter the gear, and this is where a lot of the hard work begins, where we have to look at all these five areas. Sometimes they tend to overlap each other, and they tend to be cyclical. So it's very hard for someone to say, I have done feature engineering, I'm never touching it again. You have to keep touching it, especially as the, as the data changes in case uh, where maybe there's a uh, data drift or even where like the objectives and goals change and the data that was relevant some time back is no longer relevant. So we need to look at all those things. And that's why a key feature of doing feature engineering with uh, text and audio data, it needs to be both cyclical and flexible. And that is why it is important uh, to have data represented programmatically using deep learning algorithms, and then data also represented um, manually. So if we look at in the team, let's say the business has come to you and you're looking at the team, what is the thing that they want to see? if it is measuring sentiment, what, what words do they want to use for positive sentiment or negative sentiment, for example? If it is, uh, let's say, uh, music that is being analyzed and it's audio, what tempo is of interest to the people that are in the team and are connected to the business or connected to the organization or the school or the university that is using this information? So that is why you'll find there are these five key areas. And what ends up happening is you have multiple data representations and a solid project plan, okay? So once that has happened, we enter now the model. And these are some of the ideas I was looking at uh, as I was working on the draft of this final piece of the NLP toolbox. 
that aspect of people and machinery going hand in hand is so important because um, it's very important to look at not only um, machine learning in the lab environment or with peers whom you are able to discuss this work with, but also people who may not be as technically competent, but they are going to be the people who are going to use your machine learning solution. So that is where that people and machinery and people referring to the annotators, the subject matter experts, really coming the, 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 the technical team that is actually building the pipelines and managing the data pipelines and building the app that is housing the model, really need to look at that in more depth. And finally, the key take home that I get for the model is that the model that wins or the model that actually creates the most impact is the one that leaves the lab, enters the world and learns from it. So it leaving the lab and entering the world talks about what you're going to do given the nature of your NLP task and given the end product that is expected, um, moving it from a test environment to a production environment. And then once it is in production and there's user acceptance testing and it is done, as the model is being used in day-to-day, -day, let's say a year later, two years later, is it actually learning from data that is coming in from now users who are you know, interacting with the machine learning model? You have to think about that. So those are just some of the ideas. So just to simplify all this and tie everything together, I want to tell you a story, okay? So uh, about this time last year, in November, I was geared up to prepare a talk on NLP uh, regarding how we can learn from Kenyans on Twitter. So Kenyans on Twitter is a, is a decentralized movement on Twitter using the hashtag KOT that allows that where Kenyans express their thoughts on all sorts of topics, mostly political. So now that I knew this as a Kenyan, I had to use the NLP toolbox. So I looked at what is the pain? The pain that would be there is, there's a lot of social media management, um, especially in the digital marketing space, but a lot of it is manual, right? And then another thing is, because I'm interested in impactful marketing research, this was actually an area where I felt I could contribute. I was familiar with the location and population. I also had accessibility to the data because I was able to use a, a Twitter mining tool. And also the specificity was how can we create results that can apply to other multilingual cultures? Because one key aspect of Kenyan culture is we speak more than one language and we interchange between those languages as we speak. So if let's say somebody is writing text, you will find there's Swahili, there's Shen, there's English, sometimes there's mother tongue. So all those things make it a bit more challenging to feed a model that has been trained only on English data. You need to come up with a new way of dealing with that, okay? So the next thing I did is I used the lip and I looked at what were the key personas. So in my hypothesis, I, I knew that uh, Kenyans on Twitter are political. So the personas would need to be political to affirm that hypothesis. Also some of the ideas, I wanted to learn what ideas are being expressed. So that's where I used the hashtags apart from KUT. And also trying to find ways to look for the language I knew that um, because, because of uh, where Kenya is located, of all the languages that Twitter had tagged those tweets as, English was the most likely language, right? So when I did that, I was able to use the gear. When I used the gear, I was able to use uh, more contextual domain knowledge, not so much technical domain knowledge for my project. And when it came to data pipelining, I used a very simple pipeline, used my local machine. When it came to data validation, 
I picked samples of those tweets to see what, what languages are actually there. And um, even creating features and checking, like if let's say there's Kiswahili, I suspect there's Kiswahili words here, what percentage of the tweets actually have Kiswahili, right? And then um, when I looked at data, so data cleaning and data validation, I tended to go back and forth between them quite a bit. And then data relevance is where now that plan came into being and I was able to check at there, is it satisfying what we expect or what I expected KOT data to be when I was coming up with the problem statement when I was at the beach balls. So once that was ready, I was able to go to modeling and this was the approach that I got. And my solution was actually to help automate labeling data so that we have the raw tweets. We are able to do manual feature engineering so that we find only 4,000 tweets actually had sentiment, you know, and then you are able to represent it manually and programmatically. And then now these are the algorithms that I used and what came out, all the tweets were labeled. And then to evaluate them, I used a human review, picking the first 10 tweets and trying different forms of this. So I, I tried the model without, let's say the clustering algorithm and the manual form of data and got the results, tried the full model, got the results and was able to make a comparison on how well I had achieved in, um, classifying the sentiment without having to have a human annotator go through those tweets one by one by one. So that is my brief story, enabling, uh, you know, NLP work for that talk in the fellowship that I was in. Okay. So if, as we come to the conclusion of the talk, what is this talk actually for? So I want us to have, if there's any takeaway we can get from this talk, it is this, it is this picture right here. That one of the problems we find is in NLP in academia, it's so rich, there's so many new, you know, approaches of dealing with data or tackling different aspects of NLP, themed data, you know, deep learning algorithms coming out you know every so often and then when we come to nlp in tech something happens and there's less richness of the the work that is done so maybe because of performance issues maybe because the models are too large now we have to think of how can we shrink the models um how can we uh, work with smaller data maybe than expected all those challenges make the richness of NLP in tech to reduce. And then NLP in the wild where you and I are, it, it, it decreases even more because like I gave the example of Kenya, how do you handle people who are multilingual, who code switch and who move back and forth? And imagine if now those people are speaking languages with different scripts, like what that would look like. It means whatever solution you're coming up with, it has to be strong enough to accommodate that. But because many of the solutions we have are designed for high resource languages like English and these others, by the time we come to, you know, even indigenous languages, like for example, in my country, Swahili is the lingua franca, but there are other almost 40 plus indigenous languages spoken. So what happens to those languages? So you have a situation where, like in my country, you have YouTube channels in vernacular that you know, have little to no transcription, automated transcription because the computer doesn't understand what they are. And even for Kiswahili, it does get things wrong here and there. So that is why we need more knowledge transfer. And that is why all these three domains are important when we are thinking of NLP projects. What value is it bringing to academia? What value is it bringing to tech? What value is it bringing to the actual person who is going to use this solution? So that's why I conclude by saying that 
It is needed for cutting edge NLP to be understood by ordinary people in the world, AKA the wild. It is needed for developers to create designs that can accommodate new developments in NLP algorithms in tech. And finally, though not, uh, and last but not least, for academics to better sell their NLP innovations to software engineers and even businesses. So that is the key takeaway I would like for us to have with this talk. And the NLP toolbox is a framework that you can use as scaffolding. And uh, I welcome future researchers to build on that. So these are just uh, the references that I have for the talk. So thank you so much for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation and for your work. Um, yeah, so that is very inspiring. Now, um, I have, it's not a question, or it might be a question. If okay, okay. Um, I, I believe other people also will, will unmute themselves and ask questions. Uh, if you have an advice to give someone who is just getting to the NLP space, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, based on your experience, what will you say? What will you advise that person? Which, ad which, um, yeah, which advices in general will you give that person? Okay. So the advice that I would give is um, you need to be very curious. And sometimes, especially if you didn't come from a mathematical background, it can seem very intimidating um, you know, to dive into academic papers. So my advice would actually be look for something you're interested in. Get, even if it's like two or three audios, um, two or three text files and you just use YouTube, use Google and uh, enroll in a course so that as you're following the guided uh, course for introduction to, to data science, introduction to natural language processing, you're also practicing on a real life project that you're actually interested in. And also pitch, try and pitch your idea to non-technical people try and talk to somebody, let's say in the media industry, for example, about your project and listen to some of the problems they have with the data that they have and you tweak accordingly and you just move like that. So I would say it's just learning. It is following a guided course as you have a personal project. And even when you come to the end of your course, you keep doing more projects, more personal projects, yes. And definitely plugging into a community um, of like-minded people. Like uh, I was actually introduced to Masakane last year. So that is a very good community where I got to learn a lot more about NLP in particular that I didn't know before. So I would also say you can check them out. Yeah. Okay. So next, I think we have Chris who has a question. Uh, Chris, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for this wonderful presentation uh, about the NLP framework. My question is, how easy is it for non-NLP people, so people coming from linguistics or other background, to use this framework? Yeah, so I would say it could be, it, 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 it is fairly easy. I wouldn't say that it is extremely easy because especially when we enter the, when we're using the gear and when we're using the model, it will definitely get more complex there. But like using the lip and using the beach ball bag, that is something that they can definitely contribute. And because they are in these areas where these solutions would actually be needed, it can actually help them frame their, their thoughts and frame the academic work in the past when they do their literature review of um, the gaps that are there. And then now coming into the gear, it's, 
even them it's now researching more into machine learning and how it works into programmatic ways of modeling and um, even if not understanding exactly how the mathematics but understanding the output it's something that can help and especially with the aspect of data relevance in the gear that is something that they would definitely be able to assist because they are the ones who would know the the objectives of their work like if let's say somebody is a linguistics uh, person and wants to um, maybe study morphology for example will be able to check their problem statement and as the as the data is being clean is this data going to help us answer um the morphology morphology question i have yes or no and then can go back to data cleaning and the cycle continues so that's what i would say especially the lip and the beach balls the others are where it's a bit technical but with a bit of um, reading and a bit of um, even collaboration with more technical people, you can come out with something great. Okay. Meanwhile, someone unmutes itself. Uh, I have mm -hmm. a, a, maybe a future plan question. So say you're mm -hmm. graduating um, soon. So congratulations in advance. Mm -hmm. And so what's your okay. plan like for the future? Um, you had these uh, five amazing series and this whole framework that you worked on so far, um, where do you want to, where do you want to, to, to bring it? Um, like, yes, what are the future steps actually of the pro this project that you started in general? Um, what you think about, let me call African NLP. Mm -hmm. Maybe Indian NLP to be more specific. Okay. So, uh... I have a lot of ideas, but little time. But if I was to pick, uh, I would definitely say I would be really looking into um, just growing my proficiency in working with audio more and even learning how to work with video because video has the two aspects. It has the, the, the visual where computer vision can be very handy and the audio where NLP techniques are incredibly important. So that is one area of interest. Um, another area of interest that is simpler uh, for me that I would actually start in is actually working on a hybrid computer vision NLP project. And that is um, analyzing newspapers. So currently what I have been doing behind the scenes is I have been picking samples of uh, uh, newspapers, you know, from my country and scanning them and slowly building a, a, a small corpus. And I want to learn how to extract um, text from those images of that text and basically build something that if you want to learn about Kenyans as captured by the media, you should be able to have a small app where you can just browse the name of the person and there should be a model that can at least do a summary of all the stories touching that person if they are if they appear more than once and something like that that would be a very cool project to actualize but i'm taking it a step at a time just right now data collecting phase yeah Okay, thank um, you. For I have one question, which is related to the framework. Um, so okay. the framework is aimed to be used by by people, and based on the the thing with the glass water, it has mm -hmm. used um, benefits in the wild, academia, mm -hmm. and industry. Um, mm -hmm. But like how? How do you think people can actually use the framework in academia? So it's there's a lot of things you mentioned, and it's a lot to mm -hmm. take in. Um, mm -hmm. 
do you have ways of kind of like putting all this into a kind of um, a step-by-step -step guide or a sheet, um, you know, so if someone wants to do NLP in academia, um, there's like a step-by-step -step guide, first do this, then maybe identify the problem, then the scaffolding thing you talked about. So do you have plans for that? What do you think, just generally, what do you think about the use of this NLP framework in academia, in industry and in the world? Yeah, I think I actually see them as connected because in an ideal world, the research that is going on in academia in, you know, hardcore computer scientists who are specialized in um, NLP should, even if not all of it, but a good amount of it should translate to apps uh, that are being developed in industry. And then now the end users are able to also interact with those machine learning solutions without having to you know decipher code or that sort of thing so it's abstracted away so if it comes to the nl um, the nlp toolbox being used by uh, an academic researcher it is more or less uh, maybe a help to the scientific method that they usually use so in academia, the method that is usually proposed to come up with a, a project, it tends to be the scientific method. So the NLP toolbox can help them contextualize the scientific method. And definitely, if you read the series, there are a couple of questions um, which I used for, uh, for the projects that I just talked about in my story that if you take those questions and just customize them to your situation in academia, you should be able to get something. And uh, definitely if there is demand and there are requests to have to, to create a guide, a step-by-step -step guide for academicians, I would be happy to and actually engage with them and see even my suggestion if it is feasible or even how I can refine it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll let, I'll let you the floor to say some, let me say last words and we can conclude here. Okay. So I just want to give a big thank you uh, to the team for inviting me to, to talk about my work and um, I look forward to us having more of these kinds of conversations around, you know, taking NLP from the lab to actually mainstream and not having it only by say big tech or, you know, by 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 maybe academicians, but having a more diverse crowd here. Yeah. And I can't wait to see NLP solutions being adopted. Uh, around us, yeah. All right, I think that's a very nice way of ending. So thank you everyone who attended. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, thank you Cynthia for your presentation. It was a very good and great one. Thank you everyone who attended. Thank you for being here. And yeah, I'll say bye-bye and see you in the next series. I mean, the next talk. <laughs>